Okay, let me self set up here for one second. So first of all, let me say hello to everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Kanakis. I'm located in North Carolina in the United States. And uh, as the gentleman had just said, tonight we're going to be talking about the Microsoft Secret Management Module. Today is February 23rd, and we're going to cover all the things involved with the Secret Management Module so that you can get a, a basic understanding how to use it. And in about 45 minutes, you walk away from here. I think pretty much everyone on this call will be able to start using this in their everyday usage pretty easily. The secrets management module is not a very hard concept to understand. I'm going to show you some real world examples, and then I think it'll make a lot of sense. So before we get started, my name, as I said, is Mike Knackis. I'm a Microsoft MVP and active community member in the PowerShell community. I work for Invisalign as an infrastructure tools engineer. My focus is in directory services, so that's Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, single sign-on, PKI, group policy, all that good stuff. Um, and my individual focus is to try to automate redundant tasks as much as possible. Um, I have spoke about this topic a number of times. I have a number of resources that are available for people to look at on my blog and on others. There's some videos on YouTube. I'll provide a link to some notes that you can use that you could take back and look at later on. I also run a PowerShell user group called the Research Triangle PowerShell User Group. We meet twice a month on Wednesdays, the first Wednesday and the third Wednesday of the month. You can check out our link. We'd be happy to have you come and join us. Um, it's a little late for my European counterparts. It would be somewhere around two or three in the morning, um, but we do record all our meetings, put them on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, so anybody can go back and refer to them later on. So let's get into it. Tonight, we're going to be talking solely about the secret management module. And I'm going to go over a high level overview of how it works. And we're going to also be talking about a system module called the secret store, which is a vault for storing secrets. And I'm going to explain how they work together. I'll also explain that there's other options out there and um, explain why that is. And then after we go through a little bit of a high level in, uh, overview, we're going to talk about everyday secrets usage. So we will be installing a module, configuring a module, create some secrets, recall some secrets. Um, I'm going to keep it very simple uh, because I want people to walk away with a very clear understanding of how these pieces work together. It's not very challenging. I think everybody will understand this in, in 20 or 30 minutes and we'll go through some demos and we'll be on our way. Uh, there's a link on the screen here, which I can also paste in the chat uh, if someone would like to. That's some notes that I provided on some basics. Let me just grab that link there. Uh, on. Okay, so anybody who's following along, this is a link to an Evernote that I created that has some basic notes that I'll be reading from. And you can use as reference if you want to go back and look at stuff that maybe didn't make sense tonight. Um, so tonight I have a total of one slide, but we're going to come back to the slide in just a little bit. Before I jump into this slide, which is going to talk about how secrets management module works from a high level and the vaults, um, I want to show you a real world example. And the reason for that is I've done this demo in the past and I have spent a considerable amount of time going through all the moving pieces uh, and didn't show an actual working example till towards, till towards the end. Um, and I think some people may have missed the bigger picture until they saw a real world usage. So that's what we're going to start with. And we'll come back to the slide. We'll talk about the overview and then I'll go through all the moving pieces. I'm going to show you how to recall a secret and use it in a real world example. Do not be worried if you don't understand the syntax at this point. We're going to go over all of that in detail. Um, but let's start with some basics. So right now, a little level setting. I have a test environment with two Windows 10 clients and a server 2019 DC. It's a test lab. There's nothing fancy going on here. I am on one of my machines here. Whoops, this is the wrong machine. Uh, uh, and if, why can't I get my machine back? Here we go. Let's try this one. 
Okay. I am on one of my Windows 10 machines. This one is called Client 01. And I want to demo how you can use a secret in a world, real world example. I mentioned I have a DC. The DC's name is DC01. That's a server 2019 DC. And just so we're all on the same page here, I'm running right now as a user named bsims. And I'm running elevated, which means if this wasn't a customized command prompt up here, it would say as administrator, which allows me to make changes. I'm sitting in a directory called git repos, which is just the root of my C drive, C git repos, nothing fancy, okay? And what I wanna do to illustrate an example here is connect to my DC. And I'm gonna use PowerShell remoting to do that. This is not a talk about PowerShell remoting, but I'm gonna use it to illustrate the example because one of the things that you can do with remoting is you can connect to a remote machine through PowerShell from a command prompt. Um, and you can authenticate at the other machine. So that gives me an opportunity to use secrets to authenticate as another user. So if you're not familiar with PowerShell remoting, I'll give you a 30 second overview. It is a technology available from Microsoft that allows you to connect remotely to another machine remotely from your command prompt. When you make the connection, you are sitting at a remote command prompt on the other machine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remote to the other machine, the DC, and show you how that works. So if you're unfamiliar, one of the commands available to do that is enter PS session. There's a number of different ways that you could do that. But what this command is gonna do is enter into a session on my remote machine and give me an interactive command prompt that I can work at. The machine that I wanna to connect to is called DC01. So now at this point, I could hit enter and try to connect to my remote machine. So this user here, bsims, is a user that is a local admin on this workstation here. This is the workstation is client 01, but he does not have any, any, any elevated permissions in my domain, meaning he doesn't have the ability to log into my domain controller. So if I was enter this command as is right now, I would fail because I'm not allowed to connect to my DC. So, and that's exactly what happened. It's telling me access is denied here. So I can't connect remotely to the DC. So which means I need to authenticate as another user, right? So let's talk about how we might've done this the old way, right? So one way that we might've done this is to create a credential object called a PS credential object and save it to a variable, right? So that would look something like, excuse me, I have some stuff here. Maybe something like this. So I'm creating a variable called the old way Right, and I'm saying get credential and I'm calling a credential object. So this is my domain and this is a user in my domain, right? Um, and it'll prompt me for credentials and I can do that. Actually, you know what? I don't want to do that. Um, let's and I, prompt me for credentials and I can do that, right? Um, let's do this again. I want to do it as a different user. Okay. So there's nothing inherently wrong with doing it this way. However, in today's day and age, we probably need to think about security in some way, shape or form and saving credential objects to a variable is not the most secure way to work within our PowerShell prompt. What this does is this creates something called a secure string. So now if I was to recall this, secret, uh, recall this uh, credential, you can see here I have a secure string, okay? The problem with a secure string is through the magic PowerShell, as easily as we created that secure string, we, um, I, could, I could then reverse that as well, right? So if I wanted to do that, I would simply do, uh, uh, Bear with me one second. I lost my spot in my notes here. Here we go. That I'm going to take this parameter off for one second. You can see I have a secure string here where the text is encoded, right? So it's not easily readable to the human eye, but all I need to do is add one parameter to this. And now I've pulled back a password, right? So not exactly the most secure way to work. 
it's okay if you're working in a PowerShell command prompt and you're going to throw that session away after a little bit, no big deal. But for everyday usage, trying to save things to variables and store those somewhere, it doesn't allow us a lot of security. So the secret management module sort of presents us with a better way to do this. So let me show you what that looks like, right? In doing the same sort of thing that we, oh, so I could have then connected to my, my, um, server by doing something like this, right? This is going to fail because I put the wrong password in, but that would be how I would do it the old way with a, a credential object saved to a variable. Nothing wrong with this. It works just fine. However, as I mentioned before, we're saving it to a secure string, which could then be reversed, which really isn't what we're trying to do. It's really just a stopgap measure. So the way we would do this with the secret management module is to just call a secret. And I will explain this in detail, so don't worry if you don't understand the synt syntax now. But the way to do this is to just say get secret and then call the secret that I want. And the secret name that I'm looking for is a secret that I named cred nk admin. This is the actual name of the secret. It's not the credentials inside the secret. I just gave it a friendly name for me to remember. So what that's going to do is this is going to connect, is going to attempt to connect to DCO1 with these credentials. And when it sees this here, it's going to go and reach out to the secret management module. Secret management module is going to connect to a vault that has my credentials in it and try to recall those credentials. Okay, so when we do that, what happens is, is we got a password prompt. And you might say, wow, that's not exactly what I was expecting. But this is very similar to like LastPass, or OnePass, KeyPass, Bitwarden, where you have a master password. So I have not interacted with this vault in some time, so it is timed out. The default timeout value is 15 minutes. So it's saying, hey, I need you to enter your master password, and then we can continue. So I do that, and now what it did silently behind the scenes is it went and got that credential, unencrypted it, passed it to the to the, um, to the command, and now you can see here we're connected to another machine called DCO1. And I know that because when I use remoting, the command prompt changes to the remote machine remote machine name to show me that it, that's the case. If I'm not 100% sure about that, we can just do a simple host name and you can see we're on the DCO1 box, right? And I connected as my admin account. Um, so I should be running as a different user. So if I was to just do a simple, who am I? You can see now I'm on this remote session that's connected to DCO1 as my admin account, right? But we know that we're logged into this workstation here. If I exit the PS session for a second and I say, who am I? I was logged in as BSIMS. So all we've illustrated in this simple example is how to connect to another machine, recall a secret, and use it to authenticate to a remote machine. All right. So that's how it works in the real world. Now we'll go through a little bit of an explainer about all the various pieces about maybe what you may have seen, the setup and stuff like that, and sort of make some sense of what you might have seen so far. So if, to do that, we're going to go back to our slide for a second to just give a simple example here. All right. So this is my one and only slide for the evening. And this is supposed to be a high level example of how the secrets management works sort of behind the scenes. What you're going to see here is not the syntax that you would type to create secrets, but more of a high level representation of how it works. So in this example here, we have a console, right? I was on the console earlier. And what I would do is I would type a username and password and I would want to create a secret. I would pass that username and password to the secret management module. And this is the part there where we, we were going to take a second and sort of explain the moving pieces here. So the secret management module is the module provided by Microsoft to allow us to work with, manipulate, create, and manage secrets. Think of it as the engine, all right? The engine does all the work for us, and then we have vaults that we create that we save secrets to. Now, I had mentioned that Microsoft has a sister module called the Secret Store. And the reason for that is Microsoft has created a way for us to create 
and manage secrets, we need to have a place to store them. So Microsoft has provided a vault for us to use called the secret store. You can't use the secret management module on its own without having some place to store secrets. You do not have to use the secret store. You can use a number of other modules. There's eight other modules that are in the wild right now. I'll show you uh, a list of them in a little bit. But tonight we're going to show you the secret store module, which is a vault that lives on your local machine. So if you have no other way to get started with secrets, you can download the secret management module, the secret store module, set them up in about three or four minutes, and you can start using secrets right away. So the way that that works is the module secret management becomes the engine does all the work for us. So when I type a password and I pass it over to the module, the module knows how to talk with the other vaults that I've installed and save the vault, the passwords into the vault without me knowing how the syntax for each individual vault works. So that means I could have multiple vaults that I work with and I don't need to learn syntax for each individual vault to, able, to be able to save a secret. Microsoft secret management module talks directly to the vault. I just have to specify which vault I want, and it knows the language that's required to talk to LastPass, or to KeyPass, or to Bitwarden, or to OnePass, or any of the other modules that are out there. It saves me as the user from having to learn how to create and manage secrets for all these different modules. I just need to know one level of syntax, and I can work with any module once I get it installed. So again, I just pass secrets to the module, and the module does the work of getting the secrets to the vault that I specify, figuring out how to encrypt the secret and store the secret. That's all done by the vault, and it's all transparent to me. So I don't have to worry about it. If I want to interact with multiple vaults at the same time, meaning I have more than one vault on my machine, I can do that. I'm not going to do that in my demo tonight, but it's certainly possible in some of the other demos I've done in the past, which I'll provide with links, um, you can see that example. So that's it for our slides tonight. The rest of the night we're going to spend setting up uh, my VM here with the modules that we need, building a vault, configuring a vault, saving some secrets, recalling some secrets. And that may sound like a lot of stuff to accomplish, but these are like two minute tasks each. So we can do all those things in the course of probably about 30 minutes, and you'll see end to end everything that's involved. So I'm going to grab a quick drink of water. If anybody has any questions about anything I've said so far or have a question about something they'd like to ask me, feel free to chime in. I don't see the chat because I'm full screen. I have a couple of monitors. If there's somebody putting questions in the chat, maybe just let me know and I will try to go and take a look. Let me take a look here and see what we got. Uh, question. Export client mail stores it for use on the machine and the account. I use credential like this every day. Is there a way to use this in a script without having to enter the master password? So yes, there is. I'll show that in a little bit. I don't recommend that, but it is possible. All right. So um, on a vault, you have the ability to set a password or require no password. Understand that the vaults are installing, uh, are saving secrets and encrypting them. And when you create a vault, the encryption password for a vault is the password that you set. If you don't set a password, Microsoft will generate a random password behind the scenes to encrypt those passwords, but then there won't be any authentication process that will require you to recall those secrets. Um, and we'll, we could take a quick look at that. Um, so the rest of the evening, we're going to work within this VM here, which doesn't have anything installed except the modules already because I've done this demo on this machine a bunch of times. Uh, but we're actually going to do each piece here. So you can see here that I have the secret management module and the secret store module installed. I'm going to show you how to find them. Don't worry about that at this point. We're actually going to do it all together. So I also saved on that. Uh, document. If anybody is looking at that. So I I have a demo of pretty much the same thing that I'm going to do tonight, a little bit different 
for the Southern California user group that I did. That's on YouTube. You can search for that. There's a direct link to it. I also have written about this. Uh, excuse me. Um, I wasn't at the top here. The files for this demonstration are in my GitHub repo. You feel free to go and grab them and follow along if you like, or follow them at a later time. They're there for you to use. I've written, uh, I've written an article about this. The article I wrote was about Preview 6 version, which was a beta release. This is an RC release candidate version. They are essentially the same. You could follow my article and it will work exactly the same, even though we're on a release candidate. Microsoft is looking to go GA with this module probably in about a month. I'm using it every day now for over two months, and I have not encountered any bugs at this point. So I feel comfortable in telling everybody that it is safe to use, even though it is still a release candidate. As I mentioned earlier, there's a video demo of some of the other ones I've done. But more importantly, let's get to how you can find this stuff. So in that link, you can find this stuff on the PowerShell gallery by going here. These are the two modules. And then we're going to do this part right now, which is finding it from the command line. And I also just want to say very quickly that the secrets that are supported in this module are five types. Pre PS credential, a secure string, a regular string object, a byte array, which you want to use for maybe encryption, like salting a password or something like that, and hash tables. I'm going to be focusing on mostly PS credentials because I, that's what I use pretty much all day long. Probably most people are familiar with that. And we'll take a look at uh, some strings as well, but mostly pre PS credential objects. All right, so with that out of the way, let's start um, looking at some of these pieces. All right, so in those notes, I told you that there was some files in my repo that you could follow along with or download. The demo that I'm doing, I'm running uh, in VS Code. I have a bunch of pre-saved commands that I want to run through. Uh, so that you don't have to watch my incredibly bad typing tonight. These are the files that are available to you that you can use as well. Feel free. I made them available so that you can sort of recreate the same environment. All right, so as I mentioned on this machine here, I don't have any setup. And if anybody is curious, you might see a different prompt here than you might be used to seeing. Um, with this history here, this is the beta version of PS Reline 2.1. If anybody is interested in that, at the end, I can provide you a link for that. Uh, it's fantastic. I've been using it for about a week. I started with the GA version of 2.1, and I switched to the beta version a few days ago, 2.1 beta 1, and this is what you're looking at, beta 1. I love it. So if anybody's curious about that, we can talk about that a little later. Um, so first thing we want to do is we want to get our environment set up to manage secrets. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find a module that we can use, right? So I'm going to take this here and I'm going to paste this in here just to quickly show you. All I'm doing here is saying find module, the name of the module, the official name is Microsoft.PowerShell.Secret Management. I threw these extra parameters on here just so you can see some additional information. You obviously don't need to do that, okay? You also need um, a vault, and the vaults are a little bit trickier to find because Microsoft has used a tag system for that. Uh, uh, come on. So what I'm doing in this command here, find module, and I'm using the tag parameter, and I'm saying secret management, okay? I'm pulling this information here just so you can see who's who has done the work. And what you're going to come back with here, you'll see there is two, four, six, eight, nine modules as of today, including the secret store that are available for to you to use. You download, install, and set them up. They're not very challenging to set up. So as you can see, uh, key pass is there, last pass, one password, keychain is available for Mac, I believe that is. Um, there's a Chromium uh, password manager. There's a few others, and there's more that are coming out all the time. I will tell you that when I started with the secret management module about two months ago, this secret store volume uh, management, the secret store management module was at version 
5.5, I believe. So it's a 0.9 in two months. And as I said, I've spoke with the PowerShell team. They're planning to GA this sometime in the next month to two months. They may do one more release candidate. If not, it'll the next release will be a GA. <clears throat> um, so you can install one of these vaults, and then we would configure one of the vaults. The vault configuration is a little bit different than the secret management configuration. I'll walk you through both of them. But so to install this is pretty simple, right? So I'm going to just do a uh, install module, calling in the name, and I'm saying go out to PS uh, PowerShell Gallery. So this is already installed for me. Normally you get a prompt that would says, do you trust this? You say yes, and you'd be on your merry way. That would install the secret management module. And I, I am worried that I'm throwing these terms at you quickly, so I'm going to review them a few times. The secret management module is the engine that does all the work. OK, I'm also going to install the secret store module, and that's a simple install as well. Unfortunately, the names are a little tricky to find, so that's why I put them in a note for you and, and showing them here. Install module, microsoft.powershell.secretstore, and I install that, and off I go. So now what I have is I have two modules installed, and now it's time to configure them, right? So I have here PowerShell Secret Management and the Secret Store. I could go ahead and start to install these other modules and they could run alongside. We're not going to do that tonight, but it's very easy. What I recommend you do if you want to get your feet wet with these other modules is browse to them from the PowerShell gallery, powershellgallery.com. I had put a link. I could show you how to do that. And the reason for that is when you go and you find the modules through powershellgallery.com, one of the things you find is a link to the project. And on the project is usually very good documentation that explains how to install something. So for example, I'm going to show you, here is the GitHub page for the KeyPass module. This module was created by Justin Grody, a very active PowerShell community member. He has created a number of these modules. So down here you can see exactly how to install, what it takes to set it up. So you can see here, it's actually five steps. It's very simple. I actually had this demo set up. There's a bug in 2.7 that's preventing me from using it tonight. So rather than give you sort of a poor taste, I didn't want to demo. It's something that I, I have a bug with in my, my demo. So I'm, I'm going to leave that out tonight. But um, in my previous examples, the recorded video, you can see how you can interact with the KeyPass module, which is a GUI interface, and also recall secrets from the command line. So the point here being is any of the modules that you'd like to use, find whoops, uh, find the homepage, the GitHub project for it, and there's very good documentation for all the modules. It explains how to get it up, how to get up to speed with all these modules if you're unfamiliar with the commandlets. All right, so let me get my notes back open here for a second. All right, so what we have essentially done is installed two modules. And now I'm working in PowerShell 7. I need to explain to you that these modules work per user. So I very easily could in, uh, install the modules in PowerShell 5. So I have the commandlets available. And then I can recall my secrets because they're saved to my user profile, which I will show you in a second. And I can use them in PowerShell 5 or PowerShell 7. The insignificance here is that PowerShell 7 is a cross-platform iteration. And you saw there are some modules for other OSs and for cloud-based stores. So you have a lot of options about what you can do with this. I'm not going to be using the PowerShell 5 version tonight because I, I wiped it out and there's really not much to show. It's the exact same commandlets, um, but it does work. Um, so with that being said, if you want to install in PowerShell 5, you can do the same exact commandlets. The old preview version used to be hidden and you needed the newer version of PowerShell get, but that's not the case anymore. All right, so after we get our two modules installed, which you saw was takes about 30 seconds worth of work, we then need to start setting up our vaults. And to do that, it's really simple. Let me clear the screen here and give you the lay of the land of what we're dealing with first. So first, before we let's do anything, 
let's see what's available to us. OK, so we're just going to say let's take a look at the commands that are available in the module, right? So again, secret management module, think of it as the workhorse, the engine that does the work. And you can see there's about eight commands here. I think it's nine that allows me to create, interact, manage, and remove secrets and vaults. And I'll explain them in a little detail, but get secret is how we recall a secret. Get secret info is how we get information about all of our secrets. Get secret vault is how I get information about a vault. Register a secret vault is how I instantiate a vault. I'm sure you can imagine what remove secret does. Set secret is how we um, create a secret. And there is no update secret commandlet. To update a password for an existing secret, you just set secret over the existing credential. Um, and then you can set some defaults, you can do a test, and you can unregister. So nothing too challenging. After you install uh, the modules, you do need to close and reopen. So let me do that just so we're all on the same page. Close and reopen your command prompt so everything is good to go. I think I hit that twice. Let's say no to that one. OK, so now that we have them installed, the other piece that we're going to deal with, uh, I show you the commandlets for the management module. Let me show you the secrets that are involved with the secret store, which is the vault where you store the commandlets. OK, this is very straightforward, right? So this is, let me see the configuration of the store. Let me set the configuration. Let me set a master password. I can unlock and I can reset. Not too much to do there. We're going to go through those things in detail in just a few minutes. All right. The very first task that we need to do is we need to register. Um, well, that's not what I want to do. Sorry, guys. Secret management. The very first thing we want to do is register a secret vault. So it's not a tough command. There is an example that shows you how to do it. I'm going to do it really quickly and show you um, how simple it is. OK, so let me just keep this going here. All right. So to register a secret vault, I'm simply using the register secret vault command. I give it a name. I'm going to call it vault demo. I have to call the module. And then there's a parameter here that says default vault. If you're only installing one, you don't need that. It is the default vault. But if you're working with multiple modules, you need to tell it which vault is the default, meaning if I don't specify the name of a vault, which vault should I look at for passwords or secrets? OK, and allow clobber I'm just doing because I've done this a few times. I want to make sure it installs and does everything cleanly. So you saw we just created a vault that was the most unexciting demo you've ever seen because it did nothing. All it did was create a file on my machine that that is ready to accept secrets. OK, if you notice, it didn't ask me for a password. And the reason for that is, is that the password is what's used to. Um, encrypt the password that I use is used to encrypt the passwords in the vault. Um, so when we make our first password, it will ask us for uh, when we make our first secret, it'll it'll ask us for the password then, and then it'll in build the vault for us and do all the work. So I can now say get secret vault, and you can see I have one vault installed, vault demo, and as I said, it's the default vault. Okay, I can look at the secret configuration, secret vault. Uh, excuse me, secret store configuration. Uh, now it's asking for a password. OK, um, now I, that is not the expected behavior. I'm pretty sure it's because I've done this multiple times over the same machine. I've deleted the modules, but it didn't delete the back end files that normally would not have happened. So I think this is because I'm repurposing my VMs to do the same demos over and over again that it's recalling some of the password history on my machine. <clears throat> As you can see here, there are some options that are available for the vault. The main ones are authentication, which means we're going to use a password. So Laurent was asking earlier about 
can we do can we configure this to not use authentication yes we can set this to be none i'll show you how to do that and then we have a password timeout value and that's in seconds so that's 15 minutes and what that means is when i interact with my vault for the first time it's going to ask me for a master password it will cache that login for 15 minutes or any activity that happens within 15 minutes. So if you're using the password vault actively on a regular basis throughout the day, you might never get re-authenticated to ask for your master password. You can change this password timeout. If you go over 15 minutes of inactivity, it'll ask you for another password. So it's a super simple thing to do. So I can just do a set secret store configuration. I'm going to set password timeout and I could change it to 1800. Are you sure you want to do this? Sure. Now, if I go back and I look, it's saying, hey, now your password timeout, I've set it to 30 minutes. Okay. I'm going to set it back to the default. All right. So all we've done is created a vault looked at the settings and saw that there's a default timeout password of uh, default timeout for our password and that we have password set as our authentication method to connect to it. Simple stuff. You will do most of these tasks once and move on and probably refer to documentation if you need to do it again. Most of the time you're going to spend your time using the other commandlets, get secret, set secret, which we're going to move on to in a second. Okay. So maybe you um as I told you, the vault is an XML file that lives on your machine. Uh, in a little bit, I'm going to show you what, where that is. Um, but let's start making some secrets, OK? So now I'm going to set my first secret. So the first thing I'm going to do, here's the syntax for creating a secret. Set secret, dash secret. And whatever I put in here, uh, this is just some text. Okay. Well, I, excuse me, I forgot to give it a name. The name is the default parameter. You can leave that off. So I'm going to say this is my text string. Okay. Hey, your vault requires a password. It's asking me for password. And I just did that. So now I've created my first secret. So if I want to see those secrets, I can say get secret info. And you can see here, yeah, it's pulling in my old copy of this vault because we didn't create this one yet, but that's okay. So here's that my text string, right? So if I want to get the secret out of the vault, it's just simply get secret, my text string. And it recalls it back as a secure string. Okay. Now, if I want to be fancy, I can save that to a variable. And I can do all the stuff that I used to do before. So if I want to do convert from secure string, as plain text, there you go, I can reverse it. So this is why I tell you, if you want to save stuff to a variable, you do it at a convenience, but just understand that once you store that to a variable on your machine in your session, the potential for a security risk becomes greater because it's recallable and reversible. When I don't save it to a, 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 um, a variable and I just interact with it like this, I can just call it on the fly, never have to see what's in there, right? So if I do this and I say get secret, uh, my text string, right? It gets the information I could have passed that along to something. Now, a text string maybe isn't the most useful, but the idea here is, is that you can store more than passwords in your vault and you can pass those strings in. Maybe you have a GUID you use for uh, Azure or for a database that's long and you don't want to have to save it over and over or try to remember it. So you could save it as a secure string and you want to call it when you need it. Maybe you have API keys. Maybe you have something related to a database that you need to save that's long and arduous to type. All those things could be saved as well as PS credentials. All right. So um, how are we doing? Do I have questions? Anything that's unclear to anybody? Take a look here. 
Y register module name. It's for like the other modules. So uh, Adrian, you're correct. I specified the module name because I wanted to show you how you would register a vault depending on the module that you have installed. If you only have the secret store, you probably don't need to specify the module name. Um, it will use it by default. But remember, you can register vaults with multiple vault providers. So when you do, you need to tell it which vault provider you want to use so it knows how to build the vault correctly for that vault provider. Uh, where is the vault stored? We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, is it persistent? If I close my terminal and reopen it, yes, it is persistent because it's a file on your machine. It's an XML file that's encrypted. And we're going to get to that in just a second here, okay? So um, I can add a credential object to the vault very simply. It's not so clear based on the syntax, right? Because if I say set secret and I look at the params, the only things here is name of the secret and the secret itself. So it's, or a secure string. This doesn't really show you how to create a pre credential object very easily. So I wanted to review that with you guys here. Let me just take a look at what I have in my vault already. Set get secret info. All right, so I have two in there. I have a PS credential in there already. So I'm gonna skip over creating this because I need this for my demo and I don't wanna blow it up. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a credential called dummy admin, okay? So let's copy this for a second here. And the way that we do this is it's very simple. We're gonna say set secret uh, and I'm gonna call it cred dummy admin. And let me make sure we're all in the understanding one thing. This name here can be anything that you want. That is simply the name that's gonna display for your secrets in your vault. So I named all my credentials to start with cred, but you certainly do not need to do that in any way, shape or form. Whatever naming convention you want to use for yourself is absolutely fine. The only thing you need to do is to understand what you did. So the way to put a credential uh, object into the vault is to simply just call get credential. And what credential uh, get credential do is create the credential object and it'll pass it into the secret vault for us. So for this one, I'm going to use this. These machines were built with Vagrant. So if you're familiar with Vagrant, there's a with some of the pre-built machines, there's a pre-built ID. So I'm going to use that, right? So, and I'm purposely going to do something here that is not a good idea, but I'm going to show you for a second. All right, so what it did now, is if I go back and I say get secret info, is I've now created a second credential here. And I can get that secret, cred, dummy, and I can pull it back, okay? However, I wanna show you some things that we can do here, okay? So let's go back to our original example of the remoting. So now I can say, uh, enter, PS session, DCO1, credential, and now maybe you're starting to get a little bit more familiar with the syntax. I say get secret, and I tell the secret that I want to grab, cred dummy admin, and it's going to get that password. But what happened here? We have an issue. So the issue here is that the username or the password is wrong. And I did this on purpose for a reason, okay? So if I go here and I say B equals, and I say B dot password, uh, whoops, B dot password. Uh, convert from secure string as plain text, okay? The password for my Vagrant account on this box is Vagrant. I typed the wrong password in. And I'm bringing this out to illustrate a point. It's very easy to input bad credentials because when you're creating credentials, you're simply passing information into a vault. There is no authentication process that happens to see if the credentials that you put in are valid or not. So I don't want anybody to misunderstand that when you're making credentials, if you are using like Active Directory 
or the local security on the machine that you're actually authenticating against the uh, identity provider to see if that credential was correct. You're not. So whatever you put in is what you get back. If you put bad data in, you'll get bad data back. So please be aware that anything that you type when you when you set your credential and you get prompted, whatever you type at this prompt, it's going to save and encrypt into the vault regardless if it's correct or not. So you just need to be aware of this when you're doing your troubleshooting and you get, well, what happened? I got a bad username and password. I have a secret. What? Why didn't my secret work? My secret has the wrong information. All it did was pass it along. AD in this case stopped me and said, hey, you got bad credentials. So just because they're, they're encrypted and stored somewhere, if they're wrong, they're wrong. So if I wanted to fix that, Uh, I passed it up. Set secret. Correct. Dummy admin get credential vagrant. And you don't have to put vagrant in, it'll prompt you if you don't put it in there. I'm going to put the correct password. Well, hopefully, I put the Put the same password in this time. Now I'm going to do the same thing. Ah, oh, come on. So now I've connected. So it only passes in whatever you put in there. So if you put the wrong data in, please be aware it's very easy to make a mistake, tuck it away in the vault, and you can come back and not recall a secret for a long time and not understand what went wrong. There is no easy way to see the secrets unless you start saving them the variables and reversing them. So sometimes it's just easier to write right over the old password and make sure you got it correct. Does that sort of make sense how to get a password in and how to recall a password? I want to make sure because that's like the key most important thing here. Get secret. It's how I recall a password. Right. And it'll filter on names that I know. Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry guys. I'm on my remote machine still. Okay, get secret is how I recall passwords or secrets, I should say, All right? And set secret is how I configure a password. And obviously, uh, remove secret would be how I remove them from the vault. All right, so um, I didn't show this before. But I could simply do something like this. All right, and now I could use that as a as a string that could be passed in for something that needs an API key. So if I say get secret info, you can see here I'm building out a list of passwords or secrets, different types. If I had different vaults and I can create multiple vaults, I could do that and it'll show me which vaults they're stored in. And then you understand why there is a default parameter because it's going to refer to the default vault first. You can rename secrets the same across multiple vaults. So I could have cred MK admin in my vault demo, which is a secret store, and I could also store that in a key pass vault, have the same name. So it needs a way to tell them apart. That's what the default parameter is for. So before I had said that the files are saved on your machine. Here's the path of the save that. The file is saved in the user profile. App data, local Microsoft PowerShell, secret management. So if I open that up, you'll get a file here. Uh, store. Yeah, I believe that's it. I don't play around with this too much, so I'm not 100% on it, but you can see we have an encrypted file here, right? So the stores, the files are saved, stored on your local machine. If anybody wants to know if can they be installed on a OneDrive or a network drive, the answer is it depends. 
The official answer from Microsoft is no, meaning not supported. Uh, you can do some things with junction points, um, union, all that kind of stuff, some pointers, and probably get it to work. However, remember, this is not supported. If you're going to do that and you're looking to share passwords with multiple people, um, I would say maybe one of the other vaults is a better suggestion or maybe trying to move that file to a different location in your machine. Um, but by default, it's stalled in the user profile. That's what allows us to be able to use it across PowerShell 5 and PowerShell 7 because it's the same user in each of those profiles, uh, in each of those environments potentially, so they can both hit the same file without a problem. All right. So we're coming yeah, to... Sure. What do we is have? There, is there a, is there a string length limit? Is there a string length limit? That is a fantastic question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I can look into that. However, I do know that there is a limit because this came up in my meetings for data that gets saved to the registry. And that's 32,767 characters. So I'm going to say that that is probably the max limitation because I would assume this data is getting ultimately saved back to the registry at some point somewhere, but I do not know the answer to that. Uh, do the other secret stores support multiple users sharing passwords? Um, I think that is going to be dependent on the vault that you look at. So when you use other vaults that are saving files that are off the local machine, um, or even like, like my KeyPass demo, um, it uses a GUI and it points to files, and I could have saved the files anywhere I wanted. I didn't have to save it in the local profile. So you could save the vault to a common location. You could give people the master password, and then you could do it that way. Um, there is a way to save stuff into Azure Key Vault. I have some code I'm trying to work through to figure out how to do that. I haven't figured it out yet. It's not the easiest thing to do in the world. Um, but I think there are ways to do that with a different master password for every user. Can you set up RBAC? secrets. Francois, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Let's say I have a central server that, that contains these secrets, uh, central location, and I have, uh, I don't know, a service account. I need to read a, a secret. Is it possible to grant access to this secret if you end up using this solution? Uh, I don't think it is. So what we're looking at here tonight is all meant to be user-specific local stuff. With the vaults that get stored to other areas, um, I think there's possibilities, but I also think that there's a limit to what we're going to be able to do with the secret management module for PowerShell. I think in the Microsoft way that they're going to say that there's a use case that starts to get away from the secret management module, and you should look at something uh, that doesn't require a master password like Key Vault, or AWS secrets management, or professional PIM, or something like that. So I I kind of feel like those kinds of questions are going to push the limits of what Microsoft was expecting us to do. Mm -hmm. um, I have had them on a meeting for my group, and they were very open to ideas, and they said that they would like feedback through the normal channels of interacting with the PowerShell team through the community. That's the GitHub repos, opening questions and things like that. Um, the thing that I would like to see that they haven't done yet is to be able to authenticate to the vault with a certificate. And then that would eliminate having to use a master password. And mm -hmm. then maybe you could share a certificate with people or have different certificates for different functions. But that's not there yet either. Gotcha. And um, earlier, earlier, sorry, I have another question. Earlier, sure. you touch on the timeout, so that you can set up a timeout on the master password. Can you also do the same thing on the secret itself? Uh, no, the secret is controlled by the master password timeout value. However, you can say there's no authentication, and then mm -hmm. there really is no timeout. 
So you could make it open, which is probably the opposite of what you were talking about. You probably want to have a secret that's available for like two minutes only. Yes. Just in t- yeah, like I mean, a just in time exactly. thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, maybe maybe my questions are more directed to an enterprise solution. Yeah. That's, so, yeah, so I mean, mm-hmm. so it sounds to me like what you're trying to do is probably use this in an automated fashion more than interactively, which it's perfectly yes. valid mm-hmm. solution, right? I would think that there's some options there. So there's no, well, I was going to say create the secret on the fly, use it and then throw it away. But to create the secret, you have to enter the text somewhere and that's what you're trying to avoid. Yeah. Okay, I don't have cool. a I don't have a good answer for you on those. Yeah, no problem. I'm just I'm just asking based on my experience to see sure. what secret management can do. But uh, that's cool. Thank you. Um, so Michael is asking. You can have different vaults, and you can set different timeouts for all those vaults. So that is a possibility. And and I'm again I'm looking at the one that's very Microsoft Windows user profile focused. But I mean when you start looking at one password and LastPass and other solutions. I, I like I know uh, this teams that I've worked in the past that has a common vault. They put common secrets in that uh, and they trust that vault because it's a common thing that's uh, has a good master password on it and it's for a team of two or three people. So that may even be an option. But I think to Francois's point, when you start getting into the automation aspect of this, this is not there yet. And I think maybe there's more to come. Um, this has been being built for about two years. Uh, the original iterations were using Credential Manager on the Windows Store, and someone found out that that wasn't the most secure way to do it, so they blew it up and they redid it. And this version, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I'm still sharing my screen. Let me put that back. Uh, so we got something else to look at. This version was redone, and this really is a PowerShell-focused version of the vault. So there's a built-in security for the PowerShell version, and they're looking to the community and third party to build other solutions for vaults, but use the same engine to get there. So I think there's more to come that can do better things, right? Um, I've shown you pretty much everything I wanted to show you with the exception of a couple of different examples of how you can start to use this. Um, It's gonna be more of the same. So I wanna make sure I cover the questions that we've, that are coming up. Um, let me show you just a couple of different uses. Uh, another use case here that is a little bit more akin to my use case here. So um, remember, I'm logged into this machine as this guy, BSIMS. BSIMS is a local admin on the machine, no real authority in the domain, um, but I installed the Active Directory module here. So I should be able to just do. Uh, a quick look up here, and I jumped ahead there. Okay, I wanted to do something here. That's not. I forgot to clean up a demo, but we'll. I'll do it over anyway. So, this user can can recall some information from Active Directory. That is allowable in the way that Active Directory works. But what this user can't do is set information, right? So now I can another use case for this besides. Uh, remoting is to right get secret, right? Cred MK admin, and pass this in, and I got to change this. This is the wrong commandlet here. Once a manager, and want to say uh, a cook, right? My vault is passed out, timed out. So prompt me for a master password. Now, if I go back, and you can see here. Uh, so up here we had a Ballard. Now we have a cook. So what we've done here is we've authenticated to Active Directory using a secret passed in to set credentials, uh, set parameters that we didn't have access to as a standard user, right? So I could do more of the same thing, but I think you start to see the use case here. Um, I think I forgot to cover. Uh, let me just go back and look through my notes. I think I went a little fast here and I passed over. I looked at the configuration. Did I say get secret alt? Okay, I don't know what there is to see there. Name. Yeah, I think I've covered everything with this module I wanted to cover. Um, So what we've seen here 
in the course of 45 minutes is how to install a module, how to configure a vault, how to set secrets, um, configure a vault, set values on the vault for timeout values, set a secret, recall a secret, pass those secrets along, encrypt and decrypt those secrets. That is the basic usage of the secrets management module from Microsoft and the system module called the secret store. Um, there is other vaults available that introduce other options that I don't have the ability to show you tonight, but that is really the nuts and bolts of the secret store, uh, secret management module and the secret store module available for Microsoft. If you took my notes that I had and you followed along, um, I mean, literally, you could probably have this set up in five to eight minutes if you understood the commandlets. So I do want to tell you that almost everything that I learned on this module um, can be found in this blog post here. So let's go to it real quick. This is uh, the latest iteration of the blog post on this management from Sydney Smith. And she details exactly the commands that I was doing here to do it. And she talks about some of the other key, key uh, things that are available there. Along with that, that's how I got my feet wet. I had written, uh, where did my notes go? Not what I want, come back. Oh, I don't want, I had the web version. I've written an article on four sysops that's more detailed than what she goes into. It teaches you how to install, create a vault, create some secrets. Um, it'll look very familiar to what you've seen tonight. Recalling secrets, passing them along, and some basic usage. Um, along with that, I also have a video that walks through another demo just like this. And then my group has done one or two talks on this from other speakers to get a different perspective including Justin Grody, who pre who presented for my group and talked about how to build vaults. And that was a very deep dive. I'm not a vault builder, so it wasn't really um, useful to me, but I mean, it was super great knowledge on how he builds these vault modules and what's involved. And according to Justin, there's not a lot of work involved with it. So I could point you to that. That's at our user group. You could see that as well. Um, that is what I had to demo tonight and I'm open to questions. Is there things that were unclear here that maybe we need to cover again? Can we use Secret Vault for other purposes like connecting to another OS like Linux? Well, isn't that kind of what I was doing with remoting? So I just happened to be connecting to a Windows machine, but I could have SSH'd into another machine, right? If I had SSH set up to my machine and there is also a module that is available for Mac, so you can use it inside a Mac OS. So the question that you're asking, can you use it for other purposes like connecting to another OS? I think that is definitely possible. I am a Linux noob, so I can't really talk to you much about that, um, but I know it is possible. Uh, I have another question. I sure. Sorry, I was multitasking. I'm very bad, at it, so I probably missed it. But where? Where is the uh, secret store, like in the case of the one that is provided by uh, Microsoft? Is it in the registry or is it in the file? It's a, it's a file in, in the user profile. I could show you that. Uh, let's get back okay. to a machine here. So, uh, so this is the path here, right? So it's in user profile, username, app data local, Microsoft PowerShell, in the secret manager folder. And then if I open up that folder, you'll get a couple of subfolders in here. And there's a red, um, sorry, local store. And I believe this is the file that has it because it's encrypted. Um, so the point here being is it's user specific, right? Gotcha. So that's what makes it hard okay. to use it across profiles. Okay, cool, great. All Thank right. You. So I didn't intend for this to be like, knock your socks off amazing demo this is really i wanted to drive home the fact that like with like 10 minutes work once you have some comfort level with the commandlets you could be using your your secrets in an encrypted vault on your local machine for your interactive command prompt i mean like now i've been using it for two months and it's kind of changed the way i work 
I still haven't figured out a great solution for um, scheduled tasks, uh, things that kick off on a job, or um, a friend of mine has figured out how to do it with scheduled tasks, and we're going to look into that, and I'm going to write something up. Um, but I haven't figured out how to do that too well yet, but for an interactive usage all day long, this is fantastic. It's just eliminated me typing passwords and saving stuff. I just put my password in. I just recall it on demand. I can put as many passwords and secrets as I want in there, and I can jump between environments, and it just works. And I've had literally zero hiccups since the day I've been using it in a preview release to now. So it's just gotten better each time that they update it with a new release candidate or GA. Um, so I would implore people that if you're struggling with secrets in your environment for your interactive shell, this is really a fantastic solution that takes just a little bit of work to get set up. Cool. Yeah, that, that was great. Actually, I have a, sorry, another question, but so if I, understand correct, if I understand correctly, the vault is per user and per machine. So what I mean by this is if I'm using Linux, Mac, and Windows, I cannot share secrets between those different computers, right? It's limited so, per US. So yeah, but so remember, uh, let me get back to this here. We've been spending all of our time here with a mm -hmm. vault that was designed to be on the local machine. That changes completely when you have a module that can reach out to a cloud instance, like LastPass True. or something else, right? So you can just have the secret management module in all your environments and just reach out to these vaults. And what happens when you use these vaults? So I didn't really talk about this all, but like LastPass, what'll happen is you'll install a local copy of the vault and it'll just sync up with the cloud provider from what I understand. I haven't used LastPass yet. LastPass is my password management tool that I use for my personal, but you need to use the the client, uh, the CLI to interact with it and secrets management talks to the CLI. And from what I understand, the CLI is not available for Windows. It's a Linux only application. So okay. I would love to demo the LastPass module, but I can't. So, um, but so a lot of people seem to be very, very enamored with one pass. And I think that's uh, one password. And I think that's probably the best way to go. One password, Bitwarden, and register these vaults and just have them sync up with a cloud provider. So that you just pull down the latest copy of secrets on demand and that gets you past your issue. Cool. Awesome. Um, there's a few more questions that I don't know if you want sure. to them. Yeah. So Steve, oh, to, I'll go ahead. Sorry. Hey, Steve. So, uh, an example of how you use the vault with your interactive passwords. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Steve. I'm just thinking of, like a use case of how you would use your vault. So you've stored your passwords in there. Um, you're trying to say maybe store a password for your Git GitHub account or something of that nature. Is that what you're talking? Where you just pull the data out of the out of your vault and use it for that that interactive password? Well, so maybe maybe I left one piece out that is assumed that maybe would help with a little bit more explanation. So if I was uh, where am I here? I lost my settings here. Uh, so I used this user bSIMS and I sort of inferred something here that I really didn't refer to, which I'm kind of glad you brought up, which is a good thing. I could have instantiated this command prompt as an admin user and just rocked all day long with someone who's got admin credentials in my domain or domain admin credentials in my domain. That's by all um, accounts a bad use case, right? So in my everyday usage, I have multiple accounts that I use in my production domain and I run as my a standard user, right? So my standard user doesn't have any permissions to do anything other than maybe make some changes on my local machine. So what I do is when I need to, I'm an AD admin at the end of the day and a sysadmin. So when I need to make changes on servers and in AD, I just invoke my commands and pass along my admin credentials just when I need them. And then when the command is over, 
I'm back in my command prompt as my standard user. So I, th I think that's kind of what you're asking. Like, how would you do that interactively? All right. So yeah. That was, yeah, that's so that good. Was, so that was my example here where like, um, uh, come on, come back to me. So like, I can only get user, I can only get data as this user, right? If I want to set data uh, and say, uh, let me go back to that set command, set a to user. And if I take off the credentials here and I want to change this back to a Ballard, right? right? This user has no ability to do that because he doesn't have the ability to make changes to AD. But now I can call this on the fly here, right? And say get secret and cred MK admin. And again, these is the credentials I'm using today for a demo. This could be anything you want, right? And and now uh, maybe if I put the credential param in there, that would help, right? And now that change was taken, right? So I changed my, so my point being here is this shell is not elevated to the point where I have like super user admin privileges in my domain, but when the times that I do need it, I just leverage a command that does that. The other thing that I do quite often, let me see if I could show you guys this real quick. I wasn't prepared to do this, but let's do it. Uh, where is this? Uh, so, all right, so all I've done is I've gotten out of my lab and I'm on my home machine here. So uh, get secret info. Okay, so here's an, my API key that I use for, uh, one of the things you have to do as an MVP is update uh, the activity. And I think it's Francois module that I'm using to do that. So I built some code. Uh, where is that? Built some code. Um, see if I can find that. PowerShell MVP program. So, so here you go. I've had I have the module installed, so that's the you know the pre part here. But so I need to get my subscription key in order to connect, right? So here's how I created a script, and on the fly I call the secret, and then I have to set subscribe. I have to enter the subscription key, right? And I push it to the to the program, and then I have to get profiles. And now because I've authenticated, everything works. But nowhere in my code did I have to embed passwords because I have a vault on my machine that I can call the information from at will, right? So it's not the fully automated solution that Francois is looking for in his production environment. But for me, normally I'd have to type in a stupid API key every time or save it in some notepad somewhere, right? So that's gone. And now at home, my, my kid's machine aren't set up right now, they're off, but I, I can connect to my, my kid's machines through uh, remoting and what I usually do is I create a new PS session, All right? So what you're looking at here is history, right? So here, look, this is how I connect to my kid's machine. So I create a session variable, new PS session, here's the name of his machine, and I just pass in my admin credential, right? Um, I have a, just a little home network here. It's not a domain or anything. So I have an account on the machine that I have to authenticate as. But that password I have in my vault and it's just, I can forget about it now. And I just recall it at will. So those are some of the different ways that that you can use it, right? Um, I think when you start to play with the module more and more, the the use cases start to open up as you start to be like, oh wow, I didn't have to go paste that from somewhere. I could have just put that there and pulled it in when I needed it. And we keep thinking passwords, but I really should enforce the idea of secrets, meaning it can be anything. I mean, if you just don't want to type um, like a distinguished name in all the time. Or you have some co uh, some string of text that's just annoying to have to keep typing over and over again. You can call that in in a lot of circumstances as long as the commandlets support that. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Uh, you just have to find the worst the use case that's right for you. Um, the bad part is there's not a lot of documentation on this because it's new. And there's not a lot of people that have written stuff on this. So like my articles might be the only ones that you come across that have any real detail. So I'm trying to build up um, a little bit more knowledge and write some more use case articles to show people different ways to use it. But um, we're really in the game, early in the game here with this module about what we can do and what the potential is. So 
uh, I think this sharp community members that will that look at this and say like, hey, man, I wish you could do X. I wish you could do Y. I think it's on us to reach out to the PowerShell team to say, hey, man, I really could use that. What's the chance that you could build that functionality in? And the team is pretty receptive to ideas at this point. We just really have to kind of hammer the things that we think are important to them to them so they know what to work on. I went a little long there. I'm sorry about that, Steve. I hope that kind of answered what you were thinking about. Does that help? Yeah, and I'm also thinking like in terms of like, you know, REST APIs where you store maybe a token or passwords or things like that. So I can definitely yeah. sure you can use this even further than what you were showing. Uh, when you call like get secret, do you, have, do you have to unlock your vault at some point in time for that to work or is it just always work? No, well, so you do have to unlock the vault in the default config. Um, the default config has password authentication. So if you use like LastPass, you know the idea of a master password. So this is a master password that you enter once and then you set a timeout value. So the default is 15 minutes. And if you keep doing activity within 15 minutes, once you've unlocked it, once you're done, you can set the timeout value to be extremely high or, or ridiculously low. Oh, or, okay. That's what the default timeout was earlier. Got it. Yeah, now. yeah. So I have gone through this two or three times and I'm really struggling to make sure that I cover this in a way that makes sense to people because it's all new terms to everybody and everybody's processing in their head and I and I'm always worried that maybe I did something and it just did not make sense to people so the value the default timeout value is going to control how often you get prompted for the master password <clears throat> so there is I didn't show here uh, so let me go back in the lab so I don't blow up my machine uh, set uh and see i forgot my own commands oh da, 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 da. let me see if i can figure it out set uh secret vault no set vault it's set vault configuration that come on uh, um secret Vault. Uh, that's not what I want. I want vault config. Let me get my notes open. So I can tell you guys that when you set up your vaults, if you're like me, I kind of set them up once and I just kind of interact with secrets. I I seem to forget the vault configuration uh, commandlets a lot because I don't really ever use them that much. Vault tasks. Uh, yeah, this is what I'm looking for here. So let's go. I thought I had that, but I guess I didn't. So if I go back here and move this over here. So we'll go back over here. Wrong, wrong window. So if I get this here, so this is set at the current user. So you know what? Let's see if we could set uh, the scope. Scope. Ah, so you see, you can point it at an all users profile. So then that's how you get around the user limitation. So you can save this in the all users profile, and then multiple people, multiple users could recall from a, a vault with a master password. The other option is, is authentication. So you can set this to none. Now, you got to use your best judgment as to whether that's a good idea or not. So all that means is it's going to eliminate the need for a master password. So then anybody with some knowledge can recall the secrets. The secrets are going to be encrypted with some various random password, but you're never going to be prompted to put that in. So they're just going to automatically un un encrypt your passwords for you as long as you put the right syntax in. So there's some options there, but I have tended to stay away from the authentication none because it just seems like it's going in the reverse of what I wanted to accomplish with the module to start. But you know what a secure, secure, secure configuration and you feel comfortable with, I guess you could leave a vault unlocked and just be able to be sure, sure, uh, shared that way. Or maybe the all user thing would be a little more appropriate. But like I had shown earlier, uh, so I could change the password timeout value here. I can change it to like 2400 all get and now oh, come on. 
Oh, that blew up my fault. Good. Oh, I just put the wrong password in. So now I set the timeout to be uh, 2,400 seconds, which is some ridiculously high number. So that's uh, almost uh, 45 minutes. So there's some options there, but it's definitely not going to fill the gap for a complete automated solution. Um, I would say like Azure DevOps is going to just be better in the long run for those kinds of things. Uh, let me jump in here real quick and see if we got other questions. Adrian want to know how to delete a vault, if it's possible. How to un how to delete the vault? Well, if I delete we, the we, vault, we 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 see the un unregistered secret vault, but not removed. Um. So there's two pieces here. When you build a vault. You have to register the vault so PowerShell knows where it is. So essentially, unregistering the vault is telling PowerShell to throw it away. Uh, are you saying that it still exists on the machine? Un unregister secret vault, vault name. Oh, I don't know. Oh, name. Uh, vaults demo. If I do this, the demo's over. So uh, let's do that. And then let's go back here and see. So it looks like the vault is gone because the file that we were looking at before, uh, did I look at the local store? Nope, the file is still there. So I guess you could re register the vault and recall it. But this is encrypted now. So if I register the vault with a different master password, I won't be able to read this file anymore because this was an encrypted file. <clears throat> so I need the master password to unencrypt this. So I can register secret. Uh, try to save some time here. Uh, so now get secret. So you see it pulled it back in. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I haven't played with that. So I guess it's a two parter. If you unregister the vault, you got to go and delete the file behind the scenes. Maybe that's something we need to surface up to Microsoft. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding how that works. Um, and you know what's funny is uh, I give this demo, and probably a lot of people come on and go, "Oh man, he's going to show us everything there is about the demo, about there is secrets management. This guy knows what he's doing." But I mean, the truth is, I have two months more experience with this module than you guys do, um, so that that's how much I consider myself an expert. Um, Someone on this call may think of a better way to do this than the way I've been doing it. It's just I've been using it and I feel confident enough to show it to others. I don't have everything figured out with this module yet for sure. <clears throat> what else we got for questions? Come on. No, no more questions. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was great. Thank you so much, yeah, Mike. Thank you. Anytime, guys. Really appreciate and, that. and you know, if you got questions, feel free to follow me. I'd be happy to try to help as much as I can. Awesome. Stop, Sounds good. Stop sharing. So, um, if you need to reach out to me, feel free to reach out. I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, I have a blog. You can reach out to me many ways. I'm going to be doing uh, a table talk at Ignite uh in a week it's not going to be announced for two days that's a little early info there uh so if you're interested in learning out more about powershell uh there's going to be some very big names involved in that talk you'll be able to ask your questions to and get lots of answers anything related to powershell i'm not allowed to say anything for two days so i can't tell you about it sorry but trust me it's all names that we know cool that's awesome. All right. 
Um, okay, I, I, I'll stop the recording. Sure.